Life inside an inflatable space station. The highest luxury that space tourism has to offer, or certain death in a fragile balloon. It's a polarizing subject that has been debated since before the space race even began. Inflatable space stations have a long and tumultuous history. But when you look towards the future, as business and tourism expands into low Earth orbit, inflatables are leading the way once again. So, let's talk about life inside a space balloon. The first formally manufactured inflatable space station came out all the way back in 1961. The station was called the Erectable Taurus Manned Space Laboratory, and it was built by Goodyear Aircraft Corporation, the same company known for those iconic Los Angeles blimps. But inflatable space stations as a concept have been around for even longer. Their first concepts were released before NASA's founding in the 1950s. Werner von Braun, a Nazi scientist turned American aerospace engineer and space architect, released the Wheel Station. Its design and concept are pretty similar to Goodyear Space Station, so it's easy to see where they got their inspiration from. Concept designs for the Wheel measured up to 75 meters in diameter and housed a crew of up to 80 people. The station's outer ring, or toroid, was one smooth donut shape of inflatable sections made of reinforced rubber. The station could also revolve its central axis to simulate artificial gravity on board. But the station's development was cancelled before it ever left Earth. Despite using heavy-duty materials for the station's exterior, it wouldn't be able to properly deflect micrometeoroids and space dust, and a puncture in the station could have very well sealed the onboard crew's fate. To add to that, it was really expensive, and NASA decided it would be more worth it to focus on the Apollo program, the one that eventually brought the first humans to the moon. So don't feel too bad it never went up. Much was gained from what was lost. Outside of an inflatable space station proposed by Johnson Space Center's Man Systems Division in 1989 that never saw the light of day, it would take until the late 1990s until inflatable space stations became of interest to space agencies. The name Transhab came from a contraction of Transit Habitat, paying homage to its original plan to be used as an interplanetary vehicle to transport humans to Mars. NASA wanted to use the inflatable to replace the existing habitation module on the International Space Station. When fully inflated, the Transhab would have reached 27 feet in diameter, an upgrade from the ISS crew habitation module at just 14 feet wide. I say would have because the Transhab was never finished. The project was controversial because of the delays it had encountered during the development process and increased costs of the ISS program. A 1999 policy statement published by the National Space Society really didn't help support its development either. In it, the organization recommended NASA to end the Transhab project but to continue research and development of inflatable space stations. And then, in 2000, the project was officially killed with House Resolution 1654. The bill passed despite opposition from the White House, which was controlled by the Clinton administration at the time. This bill effectively banned NASA from continuing development on the Transhab, but it did include language that allowed the agency to contract private companies who could build it themselves. Seeing this opportunity, a company called Bigelow Aerospace bought the rights to the Transhab's patents. Bigelow leveraged those designs to develop and launch three of their own inflatable satellites. Where in the galaxy could human beings go to write the next chapter of our species beyond the planet Earth? We've all thought about terraforming Mars to make it habitable someday, but are there other planets in the universe that already hold the specific conditions we need to sustain life as we know it? Are There Other Earths is a great documentary that sets out to answer the question. Like the title suggests, the film explores the discoveries new space technology has made in finding Earth-like planets across the galaxy. The documentary is one of many exclusives you can find on Magellan TV, the sponsor for today's video. They are currently offering a 30-day free trial to their platform with a whopping 72 space documentaries to choose from. 
On top of those, they offer so many more documentaries in 14 other categories like science and technology, war and military, and ancient history. Magellan TV is completely ad-free and includes a growing collection of new 4K content added weekly. In my own experience, the video quality and content quality have been incredibly consistent. I can't recommend this service enough. Even outside the 30-day free trial, Magellan TV is currently offering subscriptions for as little as $5 per month. Their prices are much more affordable than other streaming services. For having such a huge library of 4K resolution documentaries, it's really a steal. Click the link in the description box to get a 30-day free trial to watch Are There Other Earths and all the rest of Magellan TV's extensive collection of over 3,000 documentaries. Bigelow Aerospace built a smaller scale replica of the Transhab with their Genesis 1. The module has a length of 14.4 feet. It expanded from 5 foot 3 inches in diameter to 8 foot 4 inches in about 10 seconds. The module was solar powered, providing power for onboard diagnostic systems and over a dozen cameras with the use of solar arrays. In 2006, Bigelow Aerospace launched its first functioning prototype of the Genesis 1. Despite being designed to operate for six months, it transmitted data back to Earth for two and a half years. Today, Genesis 1 floats at a stable orbit of around 470 kilometers at an inclination of 64 and a half degrees. Genesis 2 was largely the same as Genesis 1, though there were a couple of new additions onto the module. It had more cameras, reaction wheels, which allowed the module to better orient itself in space, an improved gas inflation system, and an upgraded sensor suite. Genesis 2 was launched in 2007 and, like its predecessor, was operational for around two and a half years. Bigelow Aerospace wouldn't launch another module until 2016. It was in this year that they deployed the $17.8 million Bigelow Expandable Activity Module, better known by its abbreviation, BEAM. This module was designed for the International Space Station as an experimental program to expand on test out, and validate the use of inflatable space modules. BEAM's goal is to determine radiation protection capabilities of inflatable modules, demonstrate safe deployment and operation accessibility in a flight mission, and demonstrate other features like its mechanical durability, long-term leak performance, and other technical abilities. Unlike the Genesis modules, BEAM could expand in both diameter and length. It took seven hours for it to inflate from the 7.1 feet in length, and 7.9 feet in diameter it measured when inside the SpaceX Dragon capsule to its full expansion at 13.2 feet long and 10.6 feet in diameter. Beam was delivered to the International Space Station in April 2016, and after an engineering assessment in 2019, NASA certified the module to stay attached to the ISS until 2028. Bigelow Aerospace had a lot of other inflatable space modules in the works, but they never came to fruition as the company laid off all of its workers in March 2020 and suspended all activity in 2021. Now the company is considered defunct, and their CEO has moved on to other business ventures. The most notable of these plans, and possibly the most famous, was the Bigelow Commercial Space Station. This idea was with Bigelow Aerospace from its founding in 1998 all the way until its last breath in 2021. I call it an idea because the Bigelow Commercial Space Station wasn't exactly one specific project, but rather multiple different ones working towards that goal over the course of the company's life. In 2004, the company publicly released their first plan for a space hotel of sorts. Though they didn't have an official name for the project at that point, they described how this hotel would connect a bunch of space modules to make a manned space facility in low Earth orbit for both privately and publicly funded research and for space tourism. This idea stuck around with each iteration of a space hotel. The modules they'd use were B-33s, 55-foot long, 22-foot in diameter inflatable modules. They really were the backbones of Bigelow's commercial space stations. Now, this strategy should be no surprise considering founder Robert Bigelow made his fortune with a chain of budget travel hotels. Bigelow was already in his late 50s by the time he founded the aerospace company, so he brought in that old-school business strategy from a time before SpaceX and Blue Origin, which is actually really cool. Check this out. While a modern space company would simply cook up a few glossy CGI renderings of their design concept, Bigelow actually had full-scale production prototypes made of his space hotels, with fully realized interiors and furnishings, and then 
he invited a bunch of reporters to come tour the facilities and explore the inflated modules. From this, we can get a real sense of what life inside one of these things would actually be like. They have multiple rooms, corridors and walkways, shower stalls, communal spaces, and ultra-thin curved monitors embedded into the walls. The sense of scale and human perspective that you get from seeing real people inside real structures is something that gets totally lost in a world of imaginary 3D renderings. Several of these B330 mockups were built and tested on Earth, but none have ever been launched into space. There was a launch plan for 2021, but that fell through after the company ceased operations in that same year. 2005 saw the first formal concept of a space hotel by Bigelow Aerospace. It was named the Commercial Space Station Skywalker, though abbreviated as the CSS Skywalker. It was planned to be composed of multiple B-330s and have a multi-directional propulsion module to allow it to be moved into interplanetary or lunar trajectories. The CSS Skywalker would have housed five to seven crew members and a projected room rate of one million US dollars per night. In 2010, the second Bigelow Space Hotel plans were revealed. It was officially called the Bigelow Next Generation Commercial Space Station, though it was more commonly known as Space Complex Alpha. It was originally going to consist of only one B-330 module, along with two Sundancer modules, but by its final iteration, Bigelow started saying it had two B-330s instead of two Sundancers. Space Complex Alpha's first liftoff was scheduled for 2020, but that plan fell through when the company laid off all its employees. Now that Bigelow Aerospace is out after its 20-year-long reign over inflatable space modules, who takes up the crown? Well, a good place to look is the development of Sierra Space's large integrated flexible environments, better known as LIFE. They've developed five different LIFE modules, with the biggest one being LIFE 3.0. This module measures at 72 feet and 2 inches in length, and 62 feet and 4 inches in diameter. Sierra Space promises that life inside life will be both safe and comfortable. Shielded by multiple layers of cutting-edge Vectron fabric, there will be three levels of space for both living and working in the habitat. Sierra even has their own outer space greenhouse called Astro Garden that will be included with the life module where fresh produce can be cultivated for sustainable nutrition on extended stay missions. Like Bigelow Aerospace's B-330s, life modules are going to be the backbone of more ambitious space stations. The main one planned right now is the Orbital Reef. The Orbital Reef space station is under development by the Sierra Nevada Corporation, which is Sierra Space's parent company, and Blue Origin with funding from NASA. Blue Origin was awarded $130 million for this project. The station is being designed to be used for space tourism and other commercial space activities with Blue Origin describing it as a mixed-use business park. If all goes to plan, the station is currently expected to be fully operational by 2027. But let's get even more ambitious than that. What if inflatable space modules were to be used to, say, colonize the moon? Well, that's exactly what NumoCell wants to do with their complex moon-based concept called Numo Planet. The Austrian company's inflatable habitat would include 16 greenhouses and living spaces for 32 astronauts. To keep the plants in the greenhouses supplied with sunlight, the concept has rotating mirrors that will consistently point sunlight towards them. These mirrors would turn the sun away from the base for 6 hours every 24-hour cycle to simulate night for the crew on board. The company also said that Numo Planet would use solar power and it would recycle its own food and oxygen to optimize its self-sufficiency. If this all seems out of the realm of possibility, think again. Numo Planet has reportedly received funding from the European Space Agency's Open Space Innovation Platform program, better known as OSIP. The program aims to better serve developing needs in space as time progresses forward. And that's the real story behind inflatable space stations, progress. If we can accept that we don't have unlimited resources or unlimited time to get these projects finished and moving forward, then we can't deny the logistical advantages that inflatables present. They very well might be dangerous, but they are definitely cool, and really, that's what human space exploration is all about.